when I presented this paper before the Dalai Lama, I used my little flute, but for you, for you, <laughs> something bigger and better is required. So, um, too many things. Divina is about listening, and it's about listening with the ear of your heart. Now, beginning with reading, Lexio being reading, it could even be spiritual reading, but we're talking differently when we say Lexio Divina. Lexio Divina. It's more like this kind of penetrating, haunting, mm, whatever this is. It's using one's spiritual senses, the literal level of interpretation names the historical objective meanings, but in any one of us who's serious about Lexio Divina would have to study, we'd have to know our scriptures in order to grasp the spiritual meaning. So we have to start with our literal to move to the spiritual. Now a monastery, it's a school, but not for academic learning, but it's for prayer and our desire is to seek God. Now, how does one cultivate the spiritual senses? How can we start listening? And like listening like we did to this bass recorder when we read scripture, rather than just, I don't know about you, but I was taught speed reading. Faster the better, and then take a test later. First, let's look at a monk who actually did Lexa Divina, and I'd like to quote this very beautiful letter of Thomas Merton that he gave to a Sufi uh, in the Islam religion. And what's unique about this letter is, on one side of the page in the Mott's book, it talks about his daily schedule. And on the other side of the page, it talks about what he does when he prays. So what a treasure, huh? If I'd ask Gail, what do you do? And when you do it, what are you doing? We've got that for Thomas Merton. So let's look at it. He says, my dear friend, I go to bed about 7.30. How's that, everybody on the same page? <laughs> 7.30 at night, rise about 2.30 in the morning, right? <laughs> on rising, I say part of the canonical office consisting of psalms and lessons. Then I take an hour or an hour and a quarter for meditation. I follow this with Bible reading, and then I make some tea or coffee. And this was written in 1968. Not too... Well, 1964, actually. And then he died in 68. With perhaps a piece of fruit or some honey, with breakfast, I begin reading and continue reading and studying till about sunrise. Now in Kentucky, that depends on the time of year. But it's an average about two hours in there. At sunrise, I say another office of Psalms. Then I begin my manual work, which includes sweeping, cleaning, cutting wood, and other necessary jobs. This I finish about 9 o'clock. And then I say another office of Psalms, and I have a little bit of time to write some letters. Then I go down to the monastery for Mass. At the monastery, I receive one cooked meal, and then I return to my hermitage, usually without talking to anyone, as I go from place to place. On returning to the hermitage, I do some light reading. Then I say another office about 1 o'clock. This is followed by another hour or more of meditation. On feast days, I take an hour and a half or two hours for that meditation. Then I work at my writing. 
Usually I don't have more than an hour and a half to two hours or most each day. What did he write? Something like 6,000 letters that are published? Yeah, amazing. He's got 89 books and 40 of them are still in print, uh, sold every day at every bookstore. Following that, it being now late afternoon around 4 o'clock, although he did have 100 novices to help type and get things ready. <laughs> Sit there, Harry, and eat your heart out. I, you know, we don't quite have. They come in writing their own books, I'll say, too. Okay, following that, being late afternoon, about 4 o'clock, I say another office of Psalms and prepare myself a light supper. And then he talks about, he keeps it light because he doesn't want to do dishes. <laughs> After supper, I have another hour or more of meditation, and then I go to bed. So he kind of gives his day. Now, again, he wasn't in that hermitage very long. Uh, but anyway, that was what he was doing when he was there. Uh, he was only there less than two years, really. Okay, now you ask, what about my method of meditation? What do I do when I meditate? Strictly speaking, I have a very simple way of prayer. It's centered entirely on the attention to the presence of God and to his will and to his love. That is to say, it is centered on faith, by which alone we can know the presence of God. One might say this gives my meditation the character prescribed by the prophet as being before God as if you saw him. Yet it does not mean imagining anything or conceiving any precise image of God, for in my mind this would be some kind of idolatry. On the contrary, it is a matter of adoring him as invisible and infinitely behind, beyond our comprehension and realizing him as all. My prayer tends to be what you call, in the Sufi tradition, fana, which roughly translated annihilation, surrender, kenosis, shunyata, something like that. It's just this total, total emptying out, fana, very apathetic. There is in my heart this great thirst to recognize totally the nothingness of all that is not God. My prayer is then a kind of praise rising up out of the center of nothing in silence. If I am still present to myself, I recognize this as an obstacle. If he does not will, then nothingness actually seems itself to be an object and remain an obstacle. Such is my ordinary way of prayer or meditation. It's not thinking about anything, but a direct seeking of the face of the invisible, which cannot be found unless we become lost in him who is invisible. Wow, what a treasure, huh? And what does it sound like to you? Mm -hmm. The goal of our censoring prayer. Now, he wrote to this same person, Abdul Chiz Aziz, uh, a couple years later. He further explains that while one has a lot of time for reading in a solitary life, it seems to be difficult to absorb more than a few pages before wanting to move to meditation and prayer. So again, the further he got along, the less he read. So the proportion, when you're young, you start out with lots of study and lexio, and by the time you're at your hermitage, you know, before God takes you, you know, a few words will do you, because those words are already in your heart. Um, now note the pattern of Lexia Divina in, it, in this letter. He writes of reading scripture, praying the Psalms, meditating, sitting before the gaze of God, being before God as if you saw him. Now notice, the centerpiece is the revelatory text of scripture. He reports that only a few pages would suffice. Notice reciting the Psalms, planting them ever deeper in his heart. Now you would think he'd be beyond the Psalms, huh? Why would he be still saying those Psalms? It's that rhythm to evoke that, to come into him again. He talks of sitting and resting in God beyond all images. Elsewhere he speaks of praying without ceasing as he makes his tea, building a fire, walking in the woods. Now it takes a lifetime to uh, learn and if you're a lay practitioner, to create this kind of culture that Lexa Divina happens to you, or if we're in the monastic culture, it's here, but it takes us a lifetime to appreciate it and to use the culture that we have. But for the sake of our dialogue, I'd like to do a short summary of the teaching of Lexio Divina that we do here at Our Lady of Grace. So we would say, uh, most sisters begin with reading scripture. Now this text is accompanied with patristic writers, uh, that is, from the time of Christ up to the first thousand. 
They usually say that St. Bernard is the last of the fathers, uh, but I notice only the Cistercians say that uh, because they were founded by him. But again, um, it's a marvelous, his writings do recapitulate much of the teaching of the earlier tradition. So these saints provide an inspiring example of the fruit of the Lectio Divina. So in other words, if you want to learn about Lectio Divina, you need to read people that have done it and then write what the fruit of their experience. And the earliest uh, writers after the apostolic age are this early and late antiquity. That's why that period is very important to us. Now, there's other classic texts further on in our history that are also good for Lexa Divina, such as the Cloud of Unknowing, the Way of the Pilgrim, or even the Rule of Benedict, um, and even others, like, you know, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross. Or, but they've got to be texts that uh, have stood the test of time if we're still in the learning curve. Uh, because they have more embedded in them the training of the spiritual senses. After those spiritual senses are trained, you can almost read anything because you read it with the senses. See how this is together? I'm going to show you. It gets better. Let's go on. Lexi Divina is listening to the text with one's body and soul. This listening is with the ear of the heart. The ear of the heart. The Dalai Lama liked that phrase. He picked it up and used it a couple of times. So he liked the idea of his ear and his heart. And uh, because in the Buddhist tradition, they also have a rich metaphoric language. If you would say, listen up with your ears, does that do anything for you? Not much. Not much. It's more like a military sergeant with, you know, what's the next step? But listen with the ear of your heart. Mm. That's like this uh, baby, baby recorder here. Um, when done wholeheartedly, it's, so it's closer to ritual than it is to intellectual activity. I want to qualify that a little bit. The real scholars that are also contemplative, Armand Veilleux, who read my paper and critiqued this, he said, there used to not be any distinction between pure study and pure prayer. And he said, it's, it's only uh, later that that got dis disengaged. He said, uh, Lexio just meant reading and reading the Bible, and, uh, uh, and you only read one way. The point is, we're trying to recapture that way of reading. And the best intellectuals of that time read Lexa Divina, and there weren't two other ways of reading. It was all together. So, so when done wholeheartedly, Lexo follows a discursive meditation. This conceptual activity takes several forms. You memorize the text, recite it during manual work, like we saw Frida peeling potatoes during the Jesus prayer, or to ruminate about the text. Yeah, although I thought Bruno had a great distinction there. Go with the text in meditation, but not all is derivative, because that might go back to the self. I've added that last phrase, but I thought he had a good point. You follow it, but in reference always to the text, like a tether ball. Jing, 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 jing. You know, go with it, but let the text be your guide. To study and dialogue with the text using commentaries and study guides or footnotes or cross-references, that's another way, or to linger on the text in its setting to music or another art form. You know, let that music enter in and just let the music that gives. That's the beauty of plain song and chant. That is the best writer for psalms. And actually, after a while, you don't need the psalms. You just have da 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 You know, the, that is lingers with you, just the tone that we sang. And, and it rides with you at a deeper level. And, and that's why you like chant, because it's less explicit. You want music that isn't... Uh, you know, hymns are very explicit, and that's why you bring them at the beginning. So as you move into chant, that, that's going to a deeper zone. Meditation is about the text and moves organically toward the subject of the text. A relationship with God emerges. Meditation can move the practitioner deeper into one's consciousness in two progressions. First, the response to meditation of a ratio, prayer on the conscious <laughs> level. That means the practitioner shifts from reading and listening with a grateful heart to oratio. Oratio prayer, the heart responds to the sacred word, not the words, but to the word. You know, like Martha and Mary. Mary was listening to the word that Jesus, of Jesus, so the whole of Jesus. She was enthralled. This can take many forms of vocal or mental prayer. Prayer arises. The memory filled with the ancient text becomes one's own inner conversation. A dialogue happens with one's passage, with one passage or a word literally lingers on one's consciousness, or a phrase, or an idiom. Sometimes there's no words exchanged. 
just inklings are evoked from parallel situations one reads about in Lexio. Um, I want to get at that. So sometimes there is, you know, if you're somebody that has already distanced yourself from your thoughts and you can listen to your thoughts, you can redirect those thoughts to a ratio or God lets that happen. Another path is more that God's presence just emerges, is in there, and it's undifferentiated experience of God's presence. And so you see the thoughts aren't discrete, so there's no thought. But it's still not no thought. <laughs> okay? The second response of meditation shifts to deeper silence, with, and this is the no thought, see? Words or visualizations. This resting is not conceptual. Contemplation happens. This experience slips beneath consciousness. See, there's no consciousness, even of the presence of God. That's why it's different here, huh? It's without words, without concepts. It is deep silence that by God's grace alone may become contemplation. Gregory the Great, and especially St. Bernard, he says this over and over, coined the classic term describing this kind of prayer as con resting in God. Resting in God. So the goal of the practitioner is to seek God. The challenge of the practitioner is to order his or her life in such a balance and harmony that this contemplation can happen. Uh, the second part of my talk uh, after the break, I want to get into that. I, I really have a how-to talk, I really do, uh, on a strategy that, that, that moves in that direction. Notice I'm very cautious about what I'm saying. So come to that talk. <laughs> In the Christian monastery, we work and pray. All our work and prayer has as its end contemplation. We order our day around the common prayer of divine office in Eucharist and the individual prayer, which is called Lexa Divina. Our work is our prayer. Our prayer is our work. The intention of prayer, the practices of prayer, can be done while we work if we select works that are compatible with a contemplative life. If our obedience sends us to an apostolic service, and most of us do, we consider this a privilege, too, because the fruit of contemplation is selfless service. We find Christ in the poor, the ignorant, the sick. There's 35 sisters here that commute out to Indianapolis every day. The office goes on. They come when they're here. If they're a night nurse, they start when they wake up. You know, um, So the office goes kind of all day, and as the sisters come back from their work, they come in to the prayer. So it's just a cycle, a cycle. There's about... Well, we should just go over and work at our hermitage. Anyway, there's 70 of us here, so you know you can see that rhythm. The various forms of Lexa Divina do not differ much from parts used at the Divine Office, which too has scripture, psalm, silence, and intercession. Other times of the day, there is a common Lexio as part of community life, table reading or reading the rule of Benedict in common. We call that common reading of scripture, palatio. Uh, and, so, and sometimes we gather in little... Um, subgroups and do Colazio. I'm in two groups that do Colazio. Well, Sunday morning I read Teresa of Avila with one of the sisters. We just, we've been reading for a couple years and just Sunday morning between Scola practice and, and um, I'm not in Scola, you can tell by my voice, um, but she is. So Scola practice and the um, Mass, we, we do Teresa. And then Monday morning there's six of us that were reading The Way of the Pilgrims in, together you know, in Colossio, just for an hour. So in practice, most nuns I do, I know, do not do Lexa Divina in a single setting. Now I read, now I meditate, now I ratio, now I contemplatio. No. Rather, they speak of an all-day rhythm that starts with a period of centering prayer, 20, 30 minutes, which is our sitting meditation. Then maybe reading, contemplating, uh, meditating 15, 20 minutes on the passage that they're working on done alongside of or in preparation of the readings of office or Eucharist or whatever they're working on. Uh, Lexa Divina is, is your interior work. You know, whatever text or, or what's, what you're being led to to work on. Um, many take a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament. This would include their prayers, saying the rosary, and moving into silent uh, adoration. <laughs> All recite prayers all day long, walking, sitting, standing, during manual labor, during waiting. This is their oratio time. Literally every waking moment, depending on God's grace and our faithfulness, is oratio. Finally, 
complete, complete our day or sometime before with another period of sitting meditation. Now this all day long interior prayer and individual periods of Lectio and discursive meditation are punctuated with a common prayer of the divine office. See, and that's a luxury we have that the lay practitioner doesn't have. That calls us back to this prayer. And uh, while, while it's a gift, I do think there's other ways of doing it without office. And, but you see, you need Lectio Divina more if you don't have office every day. Um, and we also do, uh, the center of our day is daily mass, which takes about an hour. So we really do pray all day, one way or the other. Now, in practice, most lay practitioners experience a similar horarium. Horarium is a Latin word for the order of their day, for the order of seeking God. That you want your day ordered for God, away from the self and toward God. Now, I have a footnote here, and she happens to be at my left foot, and it's Gail. I'm going to ask Gail to come up and tell what her day is. Tell about her. I asked her to talk about um, a snippet of her way of Lectio Divina. So, Gail, would you please come? Um, I'd just like to just share a little bit about uh, my day and how it, it kind of unfolds. Uh, basically, my uh, prayer commitment um, to Centering Prayer began when I uh, first met Father Thomas, but I had been uh, meditating for many years prior to that. So my commitment to silent prayer was uh, very, you know, uh, kind of solidly placed in my life. Uh, when I was introduced to Lexio Divina, it was rather foreign to me, and I didn't understand it really, and I didn't even understand scripture very clearly, so it took me a long time to sort of take that on. Um, I didn't uh, really get a taste of it until about four years ago when I had um, come to Our Lady of Grace uh, many times, and um, I began to, realize, or to hear the psalms over and over and chant the psalms and also at snow mass, chanting the psalms with the monks and getting involved in the, in the divine office. So I, at one point, I was just sort of um, led, actually, to uh, take on the office and to start reading the office. And I didn't even really know where to begin. So I bought a, little, a, t a tiny little book at snow mass, and it was called uh, The Short Office or something like that. And I began to read it every, every day, morning and evening. But I didn't really, I lined myself up in, a way, in my own heart with this community here at, at um, Our Lady of Grace. So I felt as though, even in my little uh, home, that I was l kind of in, in reading in tandem with the, with the nuns here. And so I realized, in a sense, even if I didn't get to my reading, the, um, the nuns were reading anyway. So I was in somehow connected to that. And I, I just did that. And I was really surprised at how um, the Psalms began to really open up for me quite a bit. You know, and I would do my centering prayer in the morning and read the, uh, the office. And then I would just go about my, my work. You know, and I didn't do any particular methodology that I can say, well, I'll take a phrase from the Psalm and bring it with me. I didn't think of it in those terms. I just sort of let it stay with me however it did. And that just kept on going. And my life was just as, you know, just had as much turmoil as, as usual. And, you know, I had the regular, you know, it didn't change my life by any means. It was just, you know, that way. Well, then I came upon a really rocky period uh, in my life, a, a very, very rocky period. And there were people and places and things that were really very, very disturbing. And it was obsessing me. I was constantly with it, you know, and this, how to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out and how to, how to, try, to try to figure it out. Well, every morning I would read those psalms. And I would get a little answer, like little little things would come, and I felt as though God was patting me on the back and saying, "Don't worry, just get back in there, and it's all right." Like kind of a coach at, in a wrestling match, you know, like I was getting killed and beat up all day long, and then I would go to these psalms and I'd sit down and I'd pray them, and I'd feel the coach come and say, "Go ahead, get right back in there." And Part of me would say, are you crazy? I don't want to go back in there. No, come on, go back in there. And I'd go back in, and my life was just, you know, kind of crumpling around and feeling terrible. And then at night, I would return, and I would get to my little prayer uh, corner in my room, and I would read the psalm again, the, the, the evening psalms, you know. And there I would get, you did a great job. What a day. And I was thinking, what do you mean, what a day? It was a horrible day, you know. So anyway, I, was very, I felt it was the only food and the only nourishment I was getting during this period of time. Literally, I would actually walk in the prayer room, and I could see 
the people. I could see the events, like just kind of around my little pillow, <laughs> sitting there. And I thought, what are you doing? This is terrible. So I kept on doing that and reading the Psalms and reading and, and, and doing this. Meanwhile, I had taken on, when I would read the Psalm uh, in the office, I would go to another book and look at different translations of the Psalms. And some of them would open it up even further, and other translations would say, like, ooh, didn't say anything, you know? So I was kind of fooling around with looking at different, different Psalm books. Well, at one point, which I think was, the, was a critical point for me, I looked at, um, I was reading the psalm. Now, that, remember, I just had this little, psalm, this little office book. It wasn't like they have here, those big green books with their, you know, all these different seasons and things in it. Mine was just the same cycle, reading it for four years. So I, I read, and I, I'm reading the same cycle I'd been reading for four years, and the words came, has your, has your anger withheld your compassion? And without even thinking, my response was, hell yes. And I said it right out loud in the room in Amarillo. I looked at the thing, and it was, has your, has your anger withheld your compassion? And I went, hell yes, like this, you know? And it was like, Phew. The lights went on, you know, and everything. And I started, and then I started to think, well, what is compassion? What do I think of compassion? What is this anger? How does it, you know, and I started to sort of play with that. Meanwhile, we had Colazio, and we had a lot of questions that were, you know, coming up for me during those periods, too, and the sharing of the community words they would say would, would be penetrating my heart as well. And, I, and it, it just kind of opened up more and more. At one point, I had this experience uh, where I, I, was, I went to bed after praying, and I had this terrible dream that I was in a pit, and in, ja in jail, in a pit, in a place, and I couldn't get out. And when I woke up in the morning and I said, that it's fear, fear, fear. So I just sort of stayed with that all day. And then we had some reading. And then again at night, I went back to my little psalm book and I read and I read and I put my hand on the book and I said, Lord, what is this fear? And I began to read. And I read, fear is the beginning of wisdom. And then I say, well, then I start getting really heady and analytical saying, well, this isn't fear, that's not the fear I'm thinking about. This is emotional fear, this is psychological fear. And I began to try to figure it out. And then I stopped myself, I said, no, 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 I can't do that. You have to just kind of go with it. What happened for me was it just kept on unfolding and unfolding and unfolding to the point where at the, by the end of the retreat, I wrote my own little psalm. I wrote my own little psalm in response to all of the different things that I had heard. And I felt as though I had a map I had a little guideline, and I had a, a, something to carry with me from the retreat into my life and to just help it continue to unfold, you know. But I didn't know how it would unfold or if it would unfold or if I'd even notice that it un was unfolding until I ran into one of these people, you know, one of the, one of the people that were sort of um, sitting beside <laughs> me. And I really feel I was really, and I really did have a lot of, you know, anger and, and rage and, and all those kinds of feelings for the, toward this person. And I saw the person, and I thought, well, how am I going to react to this person, you know? I knew I was about to, to see, th see this particular person, and I was thinking, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? How am I going to be? You know how we do that to ourselves. Well, without even my... I, I, it only could be God that did this. It only could be God is the way I had to resolve it. When I saw the person, without thinking, I just walked up, put my arms around them, and kissed them, and said, oh, I'm so happy to see you. And it wasn't really, it wasn't art. It wasn't like something I said, well, on the way there, you know, when I see them, I'm going to hug them and kiss them. No, it wasn't. Something came inside of me and moved me toward them. And I was as shocked to be embracing them as I'm sure they were shocked from my embrace. <laughs> so I really felt that that was sort of something that happened all along and kept on breaking open and breaking open and breaking open. And it came really from my commitment, I think, to the, to the prayer and to Lectio Divina and how it just began to unfold in my life. So I think in, in terms of myself as a, just an ordinary lay woman in the world doing these things and making the, the best effort I can at it, but I feel sort of like a monk in the marketplace where I don't have the culture like Meg speaks about or the community support in a way to help me get to the prayer times. 
But I think when I really made the intentional alignment with this particular community and saw myself in that space and in that chapel with the women that I knew, that I felt like there was some kind of a thing that held me to it. So for me, it was a way of kind of, you know, making that commitment to hold myself to a particular horarium, to a particular <coughs> schedule, and to a particular life of prayer. So I offer that to you as just a little way that a lay person can sort of, you know, hook into this whole culture of Lexio Divina and have it unfold. And as Meg said, it's, it unfolds in a way where that little phrase I learned in first grade, um, where is God? and I, I learned the answer, God is everywhere, is becoming more and more a reality to me. God is everywhere. You just have to open your eyes and see it, you know? So I'm trying to be awake and see it. And so I think that's, that's our job, is to just be awake and see it. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, very much. Why don't we just take a moment with that, and I'll just play a little, little spiritual sense talk. <laughs> Thank you. 